hello, and thank you for tuning in to my session about how to improve your generated JavaScript code using Rollup. And before I want to go into that part, actually, um, I want to tackle another question. And the question is like the basic question of JavaScript, why are we using all these complex build pipelines and uh, putting all this stuff around our JavaScript code? And to give you two reasons, I'm gonna show you some examples. First, so the first example is something we built at our company. It is open source, a small Scrum Poker implementation. You actually might wanna give it a try if you want to. But the important part of this, why I chose it is because uh, with this application, it's possible to run it during development without bundling. And I did some measurements like cranking my browser to a really slow network setting for a small mobile phone. And so the times I got is like without bundling, it takes around 18.3 seconds to load, but with bundling, it takes seven and a half seconds. Now, I wanna say the only change between those numbers was the bundling. So there's actually not a lot less code on the right side. Um, there's no compression, no minification. So why is that actually? Why is there this difference in numbers? And the difference you can see actually in these two pictures. So it's these green staircase steps here, or it's usually called a waterfall here. So what's happening is it's starting, these are all JavaScript files, it's starting with the first file, and then it sees that there's some imports in the file. And once it's discovered those imports, it sends the network request, okay, give me those more files. So it needs to load those files, pass those files and discover some more inputs and so on. And between all those steps here, there's basically network requests back and forth. And this is adding up. So of course, so what bundling is doing, it avoids the waterfall. But now the question is, okay, this is a web application. I know what we're doing here. So what about other situations? Let's say we are looking at a server. So this time I have a um, very basic Apollo, uh, Apollo server set up here, just taking from the website. And this time we're not, I'm not gonna give you some made up numbers. This time we're gonna do it live. So I'm gonna build a server in Docker. To give you a reference point here, I have a small terminal here hooked up that is running commands on my machine. So we're gonna build a node 14 Alpine image. This is 116 megabytes. Maybe you want to remember this number. And we have two Docker files prepared here. So the first one I'm gonna run is a really very traditional setup. So what we are doing is we are copying the package files, we are installing the production dependencies, we are copying the server file, this is this file, and there's a small wrapper here. This wrapper is just there because it starts a small timer and the timer is stopped once the server says it's fully functional. That's just for measurements. And um, I'm just running a command that will also immediately start the server to get some time. And what I'm doing here is I'm also copying everything over to another the image, just the folder we just created. The reason is that during this year, a lot of caches are created and this saves another two to three megabytes. So I'm doing this now. This will just take a moment because all of it is cached right now. And the first you see, you remember it was 160 megabytes before, now it's 134 megabytes, so an 18 megabyte server basically. And startup time was nearly 300 milliseconds. Now I've got a second Docker file here, which is this one. So what this one is doing is it's basically running roll up here, taking the server as an entry point and being naughty just overriding it again. And there are three plugins, Node Resolve, CommonJS, and JSON, which are necessary for node compatibility. And we are creating CommonJS file, and that's all there is. And then we are basically copying just the created artifact over. And when I'm doing this, let's see what the numbers are now. And you see it's 120 megabytes. So the 18 megabyte server just became a four megabyte server. So why is that? That's because there's really a lot of unnecessary stuff in your node modules. This is TypeScript types. This is test files, documentation, who knows what unneeded utilities. So this is maybe not as relevant if you say, okay, 130i versus 120, but this was a really basic setup. So this keeps adding up the bigger your server becomes. 
And of course, startup time was 471 milliseconds. So it's nearly half the startup time. And this is again, the same reason that you saw before, you are reducing the waterfall time. So we are seeing this reduces the size and the startup time. So servers are maybe not that important, but cloud functions definitely are. Those cloud functions really need a quick startup time or also command line tools. So another question, why would you want to use rollup for this? So there are very good alternate alternative choices. Um, I'm not gonna say they are bad because they aren't. What is special about Rollup is that Rollup is designed from the ground up to be agnostic to the target environment. So you can customize it in any way you like. You can build for the browser, for Node, for Deno, whatever you want. This also means that you usually need to add some plugins to customize it. So by default, it works quite well for the browser, but uh, you definitely need some plugins for Node. You also get a nice choice of output formats like CommonJS, ES modules uh, versus various other formats like AMD. And ES modules is actually special because that's Rollup's native format, which means that if you bundle to ES modules and take the output and bundle it again, it just doesn't change anymore. It doesn't get any bigger, which means this is why Rollup is actually used for libraries a lot because here you don't want to have the runtime dependencies all the time. And also we have very good dead code elimination, even though it wasn't important in the previous examples. So I wanted to say, um, we want to actually do stuff with our code. So we know why we want to bundle. The question is of course the how, and what I want to, a pattern I keep seeing here with Rollup is that sometimes, even though they're very good plugins, you basically want to take things into your own hand and you can definitely, you definitely can because it's really easy. So if you don't know what to do during the talk, you could actually join in right now because this is hosted live here. So you can go to lucastager.github.io slash DevOps minus JS. And if you want to start with the current slide, it's hash seven. And if you uh, aren't fast enough to type this, this URL will be on the top of the next two slides. So let's get started here. So the first example, so here's the URL I was talking about. The first example, I want to show you is a very common situation. You have a main file here, which is importing information from a file build.js. And in this case, it's just importing a string, which is telling us, okay, this is a development build. But there could be more information here. Let's say there could be a different server during production. So this could be localhost during development, but I don't know what server during production or alternative information. And what you want to do is, Basically, you want to have the unchanged setup during development, but during production, we want to change this information. So let's actually write a plugin. So how do you do that? So, and as you can see, my setup is actually running Rollup live while I'm typing. The output is here on the bottom right. So plugins are an array of objects. And so a plugin exposes several hooks that Rollup can hook into. And the hook we are gonna use for the first example is the load hook. The load hook receives an ID, which is an identifier of the file and just usually the path of the file on disk. So all we wanna do is if the ID is slash build.js, then we want to return something else. We want to return, um, so it needs to be export something, export const type equals, and maybe use a new line so that you can keep reading what I'm writing. Um, yeah, production. And here we are, we just wrote our first plugin. So now in the output, it's const type equals production. And that's how simple it is. By the way, if you're following this live, again, the URL is here on top. You can just click the button here on the lower left to show you where we want to go to. Okay, so this was loading stuff. Let's go to another example. So this time we're gonna invent some syntax we want to use. So, Let's say we want to have special logging checks and so on during development that we want to remove during production. But so the syntax 
we are making up here is that anytime we precede a line with this comment, remove, then we want to remove everything up to the end of the line. The hook we are using this time is the transform hook. The transform hook actually has two arguments. The first argument is the code of the module. The second would be the ID, but our current transformation doesn't depend on the individual module. So how do you do this? Uh, easiest would be actually to use a regular expression. So we're just um, going to use code replace and replace can have a regular expression as its first argument, which is gonna be a global expression. We wanna replace all occurrences with an empty string. And what do we need to put in here? It's slash star remove star slash. Okay, you see I already removed my comment, but that's not what I wanted. So we want to remove until the end of the line. So we need several characters, which are not a line break. This is that until the line break. And here we go. So we just removed the second line. I could co copy this to the first line. It would also be removed. And also note that this is not just some cosmetic removal of code. This is actually fully integrated into rollups analysis. So if I say I have some constant foo that I'm also including here in the logging. And now I'm adding the comment here. Foo will also be recognized as unused and tree shaking will just get rid of this in our build. Okay, so we've seen two hooks so far, load and transform. To give you an idea how this goes into the wider picture, let's have a high level view on the life cycle of a module. So the situation we have here, we have a module slash main JS, and it just contains for now an import statement. So what does Rollup do with this code? The first thing is it will take this import statement and pass it to the resolve ID hook. You didn't see this one so far. We are gonna use it in the next example. And the resolve ID hook has two arguments. The first is the import source exactly as it is written here. And the second is the ID of the importing module. Now this hook is then call, called on each plugin that implements it until one of the plugins answers it. So in this case, let's say the second plugin says, oh, I know what it means. If someone from slash majors imports dot slash foo, then they want slash foo job jazz, which is not surprising. And actually something that core would also have done because there's a default algorithm that will just do that. Take the directory of the importer and append the relative source here. Okay, so then we need to get the code of the module and this is done by the load hook. So the ID we just discovered, we are passing now on to the load hook. The load hook will again be checking each of the plugins and the first plugin that implements it and also return something will be the one to give, give us the code. And since in this example, no plugin implements it, we have a default implementation, which is assume this is the path to a file and try to load it from the file system. So we are getting this code here now. And then there's the transfer mode. Now that we are basically have the first glimpse of the code. Each plugin has the chance to do some transformations on the code. This is intended for plugins like Babel, like transforming code, but any other code transformation is possible. Again, we have two parameters, the code and the ID, and it goes through all the plugins. The first might be replacing the argument here. The second might be injecting an import. And now that we have another import, it basically starts back from the top and the cycle continues. This is not all plugin hooks that we have in Roll. There's actually quite a few more, but these will be the ones you probably want to use the most. So now let's do another example. So this time we are revis revisiting our first example. We want to replace some build time information with production information. But this time we want to have two files which already exist on disk. So we could again use the load hook and just read this file in the load hook, but maybe it would be more would be nicer to actually change the file resolution. 
So each time this file is imported, we want to actually import this file. So it should be something like if id equals 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 log minus def js, then return slash log minus prod dot js. Okay, this of course doesn't work because we don't have the ID. We only have source and importer. So what we would like to know is roll up, how would you resolve this source and importer to an ID? And for that, we have context functions. So each plugin hook is called with a special this context containing several functions. This time we want to use this resolve. And since this is an asynchronous function, we want to await it and it will return an object with an ID property. Okay, now I'm not gonna close this one because as soon as I write the, cur uh, the closing parentheses, um, this will be an infinite loop because calling this resolve will actually call all plugins unless I'm passing a special argument which is skip self true. And yes, and here we go. So the development build was this, the production build is now log log, and it's now replacing this file with the other one. Okay, another example. So taking this to the next level means we can actually work completely without the file system. So we are up to now the IDs were like paths of files, but you're not limited to this. So for the last version of this, we are gonna replace information. Just we're gonna use a completely virtual file. We call it build without anything around this. So now using what we just learned, we can actually, we need to do two, two things. So it's already warning here uh, that build cannot be resolved. So first of all, we need to resolve it. And resolving is just telling rollup, okay, it's totally fine, this is an ID. So what we're doing is just if source equals equals build, then just return the source again. Okay, and the error changed. Now this time it's loading this and because we are using the browser built here in the presentation, it's complaining about the missing file system. So we're doing the same here. If the ID equals equals build, then just return Export, oh, okay, new line, const env equals prod. And here we are, our first completely virtual module. And as a very last example of what you can do to basically take full control of your code, patch problems, um, and do any kind of transformation like this time we want to do a self-referencing bundle. So we want a bundle that knows what files are in the bundle, in the JavaScript code. And we're using a trick here. So um, we are importing something from a file, from a file uh, slash build.js and we're actually not implementing this file right now, but rather we are using this to, to indicate it's external and you see already it is just kept as an import here in the resulting files. <laughs> also, you see that there are actually two files generated. The reason is the dynamic import statement here, which Rollup interprets as uh, you want to have some lazy loading here. So there will be a different chunk created just for this one. And okay, this is what we're doing here is we are emitting this file. So there's one context helper emit file, which allows you to add files to the bundle. And an added file has a type, the type is asset. Um, you could also use chunk, but um, that has some limitations on how it can be used. So asset is usually what you want for arbitrary files. We need a file name, the file name should be build.js and um, we need some source. And now we actually created an empty as and because the time is running short, we're just using the shortcut here. Um, so what this one's doing is basically taking the bundle object, you get to the generate bundle hook and it's just listing the names and the size of the file. So right now main.js is 90 bytes and this one is 30 bytes. And if I were to change stuff here, you could actually see the number here changing life. So now it's 36 bytes 
And wrapping up the talk now, really there's so much more you could do. So I recommend have a look at the website of Rollup telling you how to build your own plugins. And there's actually, if you don't want to go that route, there's also some high level tooling built around Rollup. So just to mention a few, there's Stencil for web components, Beat, which comes from the Vue ecosystem and is a very nice development tool without bundling during development with a pre-built rollup step. And WMR is very similar from the Preact community. And for libraries, I can recommend to have a look at MicroBundle, which is also more from the Preact universe for um, zero configuration libraries or TS decks for TypeScript libraries. And with that, I want to conclude my talk. Thank you for staying with me. Just remember, you can um, access the website locally on your browser if you do this, um, if you want to play with the examples. And thank you very much.